let's jump into this problem. So here we have a rolling object. It could be a hoop, a disc, a sphere, um, anything like that down an incline without slipping. And we want to find the force of constraint, which is the force that makes it roll. In this case, it would be a friction force. Okay, so we want to solve for that using uh, Lagrange multipliers. So let's start off with the Lagrangian. So the Lagrange is defined as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And in this case, we can think um, about the degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom does this object, let's, I'm going to call it a disk, but I'm going to make it a hoop later. It's a disk. It's a disk rolling down the, the, the incline. How many degrees of freedom it has? It really only has one, right? If it's not slipping, then the distance down the down there is related to the rotation angle also. Uh, but if we want to find the force of constraint, we need to under constrain it. So we need to have two degrees of freedom. So I'm going to call this uh, variable s, the distance from the top. And then I'm going to have uh, this is some rotation angle theta. So that's two degrees. So with that, I need to first write down the equation of constraint. So how is this thing constrained? Well, if it is rolling, then, and that has a radius r. If it's rolling, that doesn't look like r. That, well, it is, the radius of that disk is r. If it's rolling without slipping, then s equals r theta. That has to be true. And so we can write this as the function f as a function of of, I'm sorry, f as a function of s and theta is equal to s minus r theta equals zero. So you always want this in terms of some function equal to zero. With that, I can now write the kinetic energy uh, and the potential energy for this. So the kinetic energy is going to be equal to, well, this disk is moving, right? So it has uh, one half m s dot squared. That's the the velocity, the s dot is the derivative of the, the time derivative of the position, so that's going to be the velocity. And then it also has rotational kinetic energy. So rotational kinetic energy is one half i times omega squared, which is theta dot. Theta dot is the angular velocity. So that's my kinetic energy term. And I, I don't know what i is, I'm just leaving that generic. If it was a disk, it'd be one half mr squared. If it was uh, a hoop, it's just mr squared. I'll do a disk later. Okay, so now what about the potential energy? So I'm going to call this uh, y equals zero. So my potential energy term is going to be the distance of the center below that. So if you think about uh, this as the distance s, and this is the angle theta, then that is my y value. So this is going to be negative mgs sine alpha. So I have alpha as the angle of my incline theta is my rotation variable, and that's my potential. So now I get the Lagrangian, L is T minus U, one half M S dot squared, plus one half I theta dot squared, minus the potential, which is plus M G S sine alpha. Now we have the modified version of the Euler-Lagrange equation to include this constraint force in there. Um, so it looks like we get two of them. It looks like this. I'll write them down both, and then I will solve them. So the partial of L with respect to S plus lambda partial of F with respect to S equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to S dot. So here, lambda is my constraint parameter. And in fact, F, uh, SC, the force and constraint in the S direction is lambda partial of F with respect to S. And this doesn't have to actually be a real force. This is a constraint on the S variable. Uh, so in terms of if you do angular constraints, you actually get a torque, which is fine. But we're not constraining. We're only doing the one constraint. Oh, no, we, we have two. So then F uh, theta C is going to be lambda partial of F with respect to theta. Okay, and then the other Lagrange equation we get is for theta, partial of L with respect to theta, uh, plus lambda partial of F with respect to theta, equals the time derivative 
of the partial of L with respect to the theta dot. And so this looks a lot like your normal Euler-Lagrange. If you just put that at zero, then you get the normal Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, let's do this. I'm gonna do the S first. So let me rewrite uh, the Lagrangian. L is one half M S dot squared plus one half I theta dot squared plus M G S sine alpha and then f of s and theta is s minus r theta equals zero. So the first one, I'm gonna start off with just a partial of L with respect to s. So if I look through here, I'm looking for s's, right? That's an s dot and I'm doing a partial, so I don't have to worry about that. The only s is right there. So if I take the partial of this with respect to s, then it's just, it's easy, right? Because everything else is a constant. I just get m g sine alpha. Now let's do the partial of this with respect to s. The partial of f with respect to s is just one, right? Because there's just one right there. Uh, now I need to do the partial of L with respect to s dot. So there's only one s dot term. It's right there. So I bring the power of two down. I get two over two times m s dot. Now I need to take the derivative of that, ddt, partial of L with respect to s dot, and that's going to be m s double dot. So now let's all put it all together. I get this, m g sine alpha plus lambda times one equals m s double dot. Box that thing. That means it's important. Now let's do it for theta. So I'm gonna just put a line there. Partial of L with respect to theta is equal to, there are no thetas, so it's zero. Partial of F with respect to theta is negative R. And then I need to do the partial of L with respect to theta dot. There's only one right there. So I bring the two down and I get I theta dot. So the derivative of that is pretty easy. The derivative of the partial of L with respect to theta dot is I theta double dot. So let's put that in a box. So I'm gonna have zero minus R lambda equals I theta double dot. And then remember up here, I'm gonna say S equals R theta, that's from this, and that leads to this. If I take the derivative of both sides twice, I get s double dot equals r theta double dot. So I want to find theta, but I'm going to first solve this for theta and then and so and solve this for lambda and solve this for lambda and then set those two equal. I want to find the equation of motion first and then I can, because I have three things I don't know. I don't know s double dot, I don't know theta double dot, I don't know lambda. And I have three equation, equations, one, two, three. I guess I should put a box around that. That's good. Okay, so let's do that first. I'm gonna solve this for uh, lambda, both of those for lambda. So this one's gonna be lambda equals m s double dot minus m g sine alpha. I just subtracted that from both sides. This one is going to be equal to uh, lambda equals negative i over r theta double dot. I just divided both sides by negative r. So now I can set this equal to that. So I get m s double dot equals negative, no, m s double dot minus m g sine alpha equals negative i over r theta double dot. Now I can say, I wanna solve for s double dot. So theta double dot is s double dot over r. That's right, right? Yep. So if I put that in right here, I get m s double dot minus m g sine alpha equals negative i over r squared s double dot. Because I had an r down there and then I get another r so I get r squared. Now let's add this term to both sides. Let's add this term to both sides. So I get m s double dot plus i over r squared s double dot 
equals m g sine alpha. Uh, I'm going to factor out the s double dot, s double dot times m plus i over r squared equals m g sine alpha. And then I'm going to divide by this. Actually, I'm going to divide both sides by the mass. So that means I have to divide. That becomes 1. And then I get an m over here, and that's gone. So now I'm going to divide both sides by that, and I get s double dot equals uh, g sine alpha over 1 plus i over m r squared. And that's the acceleration of the disk down the plane. Um, and you'll notice, like, if I have a disk, then i is 1 half m r squared. And if I put that in for i, I'm going to get 1 half m r squared divided by m r squared. So I'd get s double dot equals g sine alpha over 1 plus 1 half, right? And so that's going to be 3 halves. So it's going to be, that's 3 halves, 2, yeah, 3 halves. So it's going to be 2 thirds g sine alpha, only for a disk, OK? Which, if you think about it, a couple things to look at. Does this have the right units? So sine alpha doesn't have a unit, right? It's a ratio. 2 thirds is a ratio. And g has units of meters per second squared, so it does have the right units. Uh, and also notice that this is smaller than uh, g sine alpha. If I just have a block sliding down a plane, the acceleration would be g sine alpha. So this is lower than that. If I increase the value of i, if I change this to uh, a hoop, right? A hoop has m r squared. Then I'm going to get 1 plus 1. So it's going to be 1 half g sine theta. It's going to be even slower. So this solves all those problems. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted lambda, right? Remember I said, let's find the, the force of constraint. We, we want the force of constraint. We don't want lambda. Lambda times the partial vessel respect to r. So um, here, there's my lambda, right? So let's just rewrite that. Uh, FCS is lambda partial of F with respect to S, which is just lambda. And that's going to be equal to uh, MS double dot minus MG sine alpha. So then I can put in my expression for MS double dot. It's going to be equal to M times this stuff g sine alpha over 1 plus i over m r squared minus m g sine alpha. And then, so we can uh, actually factor out the g sine alpha, and I get, or the m g, so I get m g, that's a g, sine alpha, that's an alpha, times 1 over 1 plus i over m r squared minus 1. So if I have a disk, right, then i is 1 half m r squared. So this becomes m g sine alpha times 1 over, again, that's going to be 1 plus 1 half, so it would be 3 halves uh, minus 1. So this is going to be uh, m g sine alpha times 2 thirds minus 1. So it's going to be 1 third. So it's going to be 1 negative 1 third m g sine alpha. And the negative just because it's pushing the opposite direction that it's accelerating. I think that's right. OK, let's do this um, the, the classical mechanic, I mean the Newtonian way, just to double check. Why not, right? Because it's fun to do it both ways. OK, so here we are, alpha. Uh, so I have the gravitational force, mg. I have the normal force, n. And then I have uh, some frictional force. It's actually down here, uh, f, f. That's the force of constraint. So if I call this the x direction, I'm going to call it the x direction, then f net 
x is going to be equal to uh, the component of the gravitational force in that direction, which we've done before. It's going to be mg sine alpha minus the friction force. And you can't use the normal force to find the friction force because that gives you the maximum friction force. Okay, with the constraint just tells you what that friction force would be. And this would be equal to m x double dot, the acceleration down the x direction. That's the positive x direction. Okay, I want to find that friction force, so let's look at the rotation. So I have that torque right there. That's gonna, that friction force is going to exert a torque. And this is going to have some angle theta. And so the torque equation says the torque about the center is r times the friction force, and that's going to be i theta double dot. That's the angular acceleration. So F, F equals I theta double dot over R, just solving for that. And if it's rolling without slipping, then again, theta double dot is S double dot divided by R. That has to be true, right? Because it has to. If S theta equals S over R, theta double dot is S that right there. So let's put that in, and I get the friction force is I s double dot over r. Now if I put that in up here, I get mg sine alpha equals, I'm sorry, minus i s double dot over r. I changed from s to x. Oh, it's dumb of me. Let's, let's call it s. That's what I did before. The s direction. I, I messed myself up. m s double dot double dot. And let's just stop for a second and go back a couple pages. That has a plus. Oh, it's the same equation. It's the same equation. So once you get to the same equation, you're done. Okay. And so uh, we would do the same algebra after that, getting that same equation. Uh, and the same thing for the frictional force. Uh, once I have that, I'm going to get the same thing. So the two things do indeed agree. And that's pretty nice. So there you go. The end. So this is part of my classical mechanics uh, lecture series. Uh, the, I'll put the playlist down below. If you're still watching this video after 17 minutes, then I applaud you. That's applaud. Okay. I'll talk to you later.